You're listening to Health Innovators, a podcast and video show about the leaders, influencers, and early adopters who are shaping the future of healthcare. I'm your host, Dr. Roxy Mooney. Welcome back to the show, Health Innovators. On today's episode, I'm sitting down with Dr. Brian Fengler, who is the co-founder and chief medical officer at Evidence Care. Welcome to the show. Thank you so much, Roxy. I appreciate it. It is so good to have you here today. So I start off every episode by giving the guests an opportunity to share a little bit about your background and what you've been innovating these days. Yeah, so my background, um, you know, I've listened to some of your previous podcasts, and so I was sort of thinking about this over the last week or so, and uh, I, I don't know that it ever hit me, but I, I finally realized that as I was thinking about this, that I really had a great background from my parents Mm -hmm. Uh, to be a healthcare innovator. Um, My mother was a nurse and um, I spent a lot of time uh, as a child at the hospital, hanging out, um, coming, going in, she was labor and delivery nurse. So I'd actually get to go in and see deliveries when I was 12, 13 years old. Um, But then on the other end of the spectrum, my father uh, was a teacher um, and a basketball coach And so he was always trying to take difficult concepts and make them easy to understand. You know, think about a basketball game, you know, he's got his little clipboard out and he's moving the little magnets around trying to draw an inbounds play to win the game. And I thought, (laughs) wow, like that's kind of what I do. Like I'm, um, you know, I'm a physician um, and I loved evidence-based medicine and, you know, passionate about trying to help, uh, you know, other physicians deliver the best care to their patients. But at the same time, I almost have to take that educator hat because I'm always trying to think about how can I take difficult concepts and make them easier or things that are inefficient within an EHR and and make them more efficient. Um, And so I I just realized now, geez, like it it probably, a lot of it probably came from my parents in terms of, you know, what, what I learned from them growing up. Always, always. It's such a beautiful thing when you have that epiphany and you see the dots and it's not as random as we maybe originally thought. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. So every every founder has a founder story, mm-hmm. um, but I think you have a really interesting founder story. So tell our audience a little bit about um, what motivated you to start this company. <clears throat> Yeah. So um, when I was uh, a resident uh, and I'm an emergency physician, um, so when I was in my training, um, we had a patient come into the emergency room with a massive blood clot in his lungs. And we were about to give him some clot busting medicines. Um, But just before we gave those medicines, uh, a team of doctors from the ICU came down and there was a little bit of a disagreement about whether we should give that medication or not. Mm -hmm. Um, And as it turned out, the ICU team sort of took charge of the situation and said, no, we're not going to give this medicine. Mm -hmm. And so they took the patient up to the ICU and the patient never received the clot busting medicines and and ended up dying uh, a a few hours later. And so this became a big case um, where I trained and, and I ended up doing a year of research and I ended up publishing a protocol on how emergency physicians should assess patients with that condition and, um, you know, what the best strategy for treating that patient is based on that patient's individual factors. Um, and so I finished residency and I moved to Nashville and I started practicing emergency medicine. And um, the middle of the night, one night at the hospital, um, a, a woman presented and, and she had a huge blood clot. Um, between her heart and her lungs. She couldn't, you know, is having uh, obstruction of blood flow out of her heart. And she was very sick. And I knew I had to do something very quickly. Um, But the problem was she was also 36 weeks pregnant. Mm -hmm. Um, And so here I am, you know, air quotes here, the expert on this condition. um, And yet I was still at a loss for um, what was the best therapy for not only her, but her unborn child. Um, And so I did what 86% of doctors do when they have a clinical question, which is they go to Google. This is the Um, punchline. Yeah. yeah. (laughs) And I found myself on Google and Mm -hmm. and I couldn't find the information I needed fast enough. And uh, the nurse was, you know, yelling to me from the patient's room, Dr. Fengler, I need you in here. 
And, and I went into the room and the woman is, is about to go into cardiac arrest. And, um, I had to make a split second decision. And so I, I went up to the patient. I said, ma'am, you're very sick. You have a clot sitting between your heart and your lungs. I'm worried your heart could stop at any moment. I'm going to give you this clot buster to try to break up this clot and save your life. Uh, and she looked up at me and she says, well, what's the risk to my baby? Mm -hmm. And I said, ma'am, I don't know. But if I don't save your life, then your, your baby's going to die also. Um, and so that moment um, sort of start me, uh, uh, you know, began the path and, and the passion I have for, you know, how can we help bring the right information at the right point in time into physicians' workflows so that we can help them make the best decision for each patient. Um, and that's really what's, you know, led me to go on and start Evidence Care. So let's talk. So a very fascinating story. And I love your candidness and transparency about Dr. Google because <laughs> um, mm -hmm. and, and th this leads me to my question. Um, you know, I, I think that there's maybe one perception or a perception about evidence based care. Right. Yeah. Um, if I take my health innovator hat off and I just think of myself as a consumer, I am thinking that all care is based upon evidence. Um, so why do we need a company like yours? And what it like kind of give us a state of the union on yeah. evidence in healthcare, because you just assume that every type of care, whether it's a health tech solution, a medication or a protocol, that it's going to be based upon some type of evidence. <clears throat> yeah, um, some more scary statistics. <laughs> um, this study was done about four or five years ago, but at that time it showed that um, only about 20% of medical decisions were evidence-based. Um, also at that same time, this was probably two or three years ago, um, there was studies that showed that the average physician is seven to 10 years behind the guidelines. Um, and so the problem is that medical knowledge and evidence is evolving so quickly um, it is impossible for any human being, no matter how dedicated they are, um, to keep up with all of that evidence. Um, and so that's where, you know, there um, needs to be decision support and assistance um, to help them because, you know, you would have to read 160 hours every week just mm -hmm. to keep up with the medical evidence in your specialty alone. Right. Um, so yeah. impossible. Mm -hmm. Um, and so physicians know that they don't know everything and, and they know that they need to be able to access quickly the information they need, but mm -hmm. it needs to be patient specific because you can't pull up a textbook chapter about pulmonary embolism, which is the condition my, my patient had and, and spend two hours reading it when you have a patient who's dying in front of you. And so that's where now with, um, you know, technology, we can incorporate all those patient factors. We can have algorithms that then present the appropriate uh, recommendations to the provider. And it's still their decision, but now we're, at, we're giving them, uh, you know, sort of the answers to the test yeah. um, that are specific for that patient. So there's a lot of clinical decision support tools out in the marketplace. Mm -hmm. What makes what you're doing, um, you know, solving an unmet need compared to what's already in the marketplace? <clears throat> yeah. So we've worked really hard to build. Um, and, I, and I know this is a recurring theme on your shows about platforms, um, mm -hmm. but, but, you know, we've built a platform uh, yeah. that is EHR agnostic that um, is interoperable, so uses all the latest interoperable frameworks. Um, and, and our focus is really on physician workflow mm -hmm. um, because we know the physicians, you know, they're counting clicks. And, and so if, if we're introducing something that's causing them to have to make more clicks, have to spend more time, they're just not going to adopt it because their nature is, you know, they're so busy that they just don't have time. And so we focus very hard on the workflow of our tools so that we're improving their efficiency while also helping them deliver better care to their patients and have better outcomes and actually generate uh, you know, a better financial situation for the hospital 
um, so that we can really make it a, a win-win-win for everybody involved in that situation. So you said a word that just really strikes me, and the word is adoption. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, I I feel really strongly about this. Um, I'm not sure about the rest of the world, but in my mind and in my experience, we don't have a technology problem or an innovation problem. We don't need any more tech or innovation, although it'll be great and it'll never stop. Um, But we really I think we have more of an adoption problem than we have a technology or a um, um, uh, innovation problem. So what's your thoughts on that? And what are some of the gaps between what's available in the marketplace and adoption and what you're doing differently? Because I can tell you that there are hundreds and thousands of tools out there on the marketplace that could be great, but they aren't necessarily seeing the adoption that you're talking about and yep. help me under, help us understand why. Yeah. Adoption is, is multifactorial. Um, you know, there's a lot of stakeholders involved. Um, n- number one, obviously it starts with the physician's we have to give them a tool that is a delight to use that uh, they don't feel like it's an extra burden on them. And they feel like it's adding value from a workflow and decision-making perspective. Mm -hmm. But then on top of that, you know, there also are all the other stakeholders in the health system. um, You know, the medical directors for that service line, the chief medical officer, uh, the CFO or CEO of the hospital. Um, And so there really needs to be good, uh, leadership and 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 governance over the adoption of any tools. There has to be support at all levels because if it breaks down at any level, uh, you know the physicians will. You know we start using this tool. Hey, this tool is kind of cool. We like it, and then they don't hear anything from their administration about it. Their response is going to be, well, it must not really be that important because they're not really. You know, it's not an initiative of the health system, and so there really needs to be strong alignment from everybody involved to yeah. say, this is important. Here's why it's important. And we're going to track it. We're going to monitor it. We're going to report it. Um, we're going to show you where you're improving so they can have that feedback loop um, because it always feels good to know, okay, I've been doing something. Now, what was the impact of what I was doing? Well, it turns out that you actually reduced your length of stay by eight hours per patient, or um, you know, you reduced your 30-day readmission rates or things like that. And so now they're saying, okay, my goal is to take better care of my patients. And when I'm using these tools, it's demonstrating, you know, with with, uh, tangible numbers that I'm improving my patients' outcomes. So then it just feeds back into that loop of, okay, this this feels good. It's easy to use. It's leading to better outcomes. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, and so that's where it really is sort of a, a comprehensive strategy that we've had to take. Um, in terms of driving adoption and and uh, customer success. So what was it like for you um, in the early stages, identifying the value proposition for each one of those stakeholder groups that you just mentioned? Because, you know, I think that's another one of those pitfalls when we're talking about the commercial process is, you know, when we're yeah. building out our business plans, our commercial strategy, we might, you know, really focus on one or two audiences and forget some of the other key decision makers. And, you know, that can be, that can negatively impact our adoption or, being able to win paying customers. <clears throat> yeah, it was it was hard. We had no idea what we were doing. <laughs> um, <laughs> and you were in and, the system. <laughs> yes. Um, <clears throat> yeah. So we um, we actually pivoted a little bit. You know, we we started off as a company focusing very narrowly on on clinical pathways. Yeah. And and the feedback we were getting from my physician colleagues were, you know, this is amazing. These are so easy to use. This is bringing the uh, evidence into my workflow. This is exactly what I want. But we didn't have the other side of the equation, which is we didn't have the clinical benefits documented. We didn't have the financial benefits documented. And so we were realizing all the docs want to use our tools, but we're we're having a hard time contracting and getting revenue from our health system clients. Yeah. And so finally we realized, you know, we had to have our clinical tools uh, be built and, and have use cases in a way that we are not only making the physician's job easier and driving clinical benefit for them and their patients, but we're also able to demonstrate operational and financial benefits to the organization. And we made that shift, you know, a few years ago, and, mm-hmm. and it's completely changed the trajectory of the company because now, you know, we have the CFO 
uh, selling us to their physicians for us because, you know, they're seeing, That's okay, here's, <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. And, and, and the conversation is so much different because um, now we have um, answers to each of those questions that each of the stakeholders is going to ask us and, 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 and obviously results from other clients where we've shown that. Um, and, and that's why, you know, the conversations are so much different now than they were back when we first started. Great, great answers. Hey, it's Dr. Roxy here with a quick break from the conversation. Are you trying to figure out what moves you need to make to survive and thrive in the new COVID economy? I want every health innovator to find their most viable and profitable pivot strategy, which is why I created the COVID Proof Your Business Pivot Kit. The Pivot Kit is a step-by-step -step framework that helps you find your best pivot strategy. It walks you through six categories you need to examine for a 360-degree view of your business. I call them the six critical pivot lenses. As you make your way through this comprehensive kit, you'll be armed with the tools, tips, and strategies you need to make sure you can pivot with speed without missing out on critical details and opportunities. Learn more at legacy-dna.com backslash kit. What advice would you have for the other uh, innovators that are at different phases of this journey that maybe are struggling with that scalable growth um, for, for some of these similar reasons? What are some of the lessons learned? You talked about the lesson learned, but what is some of that guidance that you would have? <clears throat> yeah, so, um, you know, same thing as most business books will tell you, you know, I'd probably start with focus. Um, it's so easy to get distracted. Mm -hmm. And um, you'll have you'll hear lots of ideas from lots of people, and it'll seem attractive to go down all these different paths. And really, all you're doing is distracting your team from identifying your your primary use case, your primary value proposition, and um, getting validation of that as quickly as possible. And, and we struggled a little bit with that early on too. You know, all these great ideas were coming in. This sounds great. Yeah, we can do this. Um, and it wasn't that the the from a technology perspective, we could do it, but then what, it, what takes so much longer on the tail end is, uh, you know, a deployment within a health system and then the data coming in and how long it takes to get uh, feedback and, and, and KPIs and all those things. And, and so when you say you're going to do something, you know, it's taking you down a probably a 12 to 18 month journey. And so you got to think ahead of time, like, is this is this something we want to spend the next year, year and a half doing? And so mm -hmm. my, my first thing would be focus. Um, my second thing would be, um, you know, raise way more money than you think you need. Um, you know, back, you know, a long time ago, we thought we needed this amount of capital. If we had this amount of capital, we could grow the company, do anything we ever needed to do. Um, make whatever that number is, you know, probably five exits um, because- <laughs> Um, everything takes longer in health system, health in healthcare, excuse me. Um, you know, our sales cycle is, is, is about a year. Mm -hmm. Um, Which and is so kind of shorter than a lot of people. So that's good. <laughs> it's not yeah. 18 to 24 months. <laughs> yeah. So it, 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 um, you know, takes longer than you think in healthcare and, um, you know, they have so much going on. They have so many options for solutions. They have so many headwinds coming at them constantly. Um, and so you need to, to have the capital um, to, to ride it out, but, but also have the focus from a team perspective to know that every day you're making your primary or secondary use cases as best as they can be, as efficient as they can be, and, um, and, and driving the most value from those. So speaking of value, um, <clears throat> you know, in in some of our dialogue previously, you mentioned, um, you know, improving the patient experience, increasing revenue and decreasing cost. And there's a lot of organizations that are that have value propositions or promising ROI around mm -hmm. those um, those pillars. So what you know, when you think about how you're messaging your uh, in developing those value propositions, how are you different? How are you speaking to those measures that are very important to the CFO and different stakeholders within your target audience, but also standing out? So you're not just another solution that's improving the patient experience and increasing revenue and decreasing costs. Yeah. Um, 
it, it's tough, but um, you know, we we knew coming out of COVID that margins were going to be one of the highest priority issues for for health systems. And um, a few of our tools, while clinical, um, one of them helps directly um, increase revenue for the hospital systems. Um, so it, it 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 helps them with when a patient gets admitted, determine the appropriate bed status for that patient. Um, and help to assure that, you know, the payer's going to pay and not deny that admission. Um, and, and so in that way, we're, you know, helping with what is initiative at every health system, which is improve physician documentation around admissions, reduce denials. I don't know a single health system that doesn't have that as an initiative. And then another one of our tools, you know, is a tool that once the patient's hospitalized, you know, decreasing their cost of care um, by, by reducing care variation. And so same thing, like what health system today doesn't want to uh, decrease cost of care? Um, and so that's where we've been very fortunate to be able to sort of align with those um, priorities that, that every mm -hmm. health system has right now. And, you know, we've been able to sort of um, ride that. Um, we deal only in the, in the acute care space, so, so hospitals. Um, and we know there's a lot of strategy, you know, ambulatory strategies and post-acute and yep. uh, direct to patient, you know, and all those things. And all those things are, are, are great. And, you know, there's opportunities in those areas, but going back to our focus, you know, we've just said our market is the hospitals and helping our hospital clients. And so that's one way that we've narrowed down to, we're not going out and meeting with, uh, you know, folks around post-acute strategies or ambulatory or, or anything like that, where we're very focused on you know, what our solutions um, help them with. Going back to my favorite F word, focus. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. It's uh, tough. It's very yeah. tough. Uh, and, and I'm probably the worst offender because uh, everything, uh, new ideas are exciting, you know? And and uh, um, so it, it, it is a challenge uh, all the time to, to stay focused. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, when I hear you describing this, what it what I hear is it comes back really, it's 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 different evidence, but it's evidence, right? So it's not just the clinical evidence for decision support making, which is what you're offering to these physicians and to these health systems, but also the evidence that you needed to be able to have a stronger ROI strategy um, around your value proposition. So, you know, a we all know that we need to generate um, ROI and we need to be able to make that um, part of our um, sales story in order to be successful. But sometimes it's difficult tracking it, measuring it, and yep reporting it, like gathering it from that end customer to be able to have that success story, to be able to go back and use in your sales process to drive, you know, growth. Um, so kind of just explain to us what your pro experience has been like with that and how did you maybe overcome it to have more of those documented ROI stories? Yeah. So one of the, the benefits we have is how deep our integrations are into the EHRs. Um, you know, we're, we're so deep in the EHRs that we're, we're directly within their workflow. We're bi-directional, you know, all those things. Yeah. But because of that, we're actually capturing all the data that we need um, while we're being used. Um, mm -hmm. And so, uh, you know, we can very precisely track, um, uh, you know, denials, uh, bed status determination, cost of care, length of stay. Yeah. Um, and then we, uh, you know, a few years ago, um, all that data was coming into Excel spreadsheets and our team was, uh, drive, you know, getting <laughs> driven crazy by all of the requests from our clients for, oh, we want to see the data this way and we want to see it that way. And what about this? And um, so we realized finally, okay, we just need to 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 load this into an analytics suite. And so um, we're now taking all that data, we're bringing it into our analytics suite, um, and it's all the client's data, mm -hmm. and it's all based off of our utilization. So we're able to draw a direct line to, you know, when our tool is used, this happens, versus when we're not, that happens. And we compare it with their baseline, and, and we can show them precisely, you know, where the uh, improvement is and what that means from a financial perspective. 
So I think there's going to be a lot of people in the audience um, wanting to know this question is, how did you get so integrated into the EHR system and being agnostic to be able to get integrated into multiple, if not all, EHR systems? Um, from, from the folks that I've talked to, there's kind of like a line outside the door <laughs> yeah. of, of, you know, can I, can I how can we work together? How can we collaborate? And there's a lot of barriers to overcome that. So what was your uh, experience like on that? Yeah, I, and and I think the biggest thing is it 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 takes time. It's not going to happen overnight, mm-hmm. and that goes back to funding and capital and having the time, because you're not going to build deep integrations into EHRs in six months. It it takes years. Yeah. Um, and and the second piece of that is you know we've brought uh, amazing people onto our team that have that experience with the various EHRs. Mm-hmm. who are the experts in that system. Yeah. Um, and, and every one of them, you know, while our platform is EHR agnostic and interoperable, none of the EHRs are. Um, and so it is, it is hand-to-hand combat with every EHR. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and it just takes time. And, and we're constantly improving our integrations into this EHR or that EHR um, as, as we build out, you know, additional features and, um, and, and, Fortunately, as we do that, we're able to offer that to all of our clients. And so it's just a constant evolution of the platform of um, making it better, making it easier within the EHR, getting more of the data we need. Um, but but it does take time. So um, patience, right? Just patience and persistence is what I hear, um, which is no surprise, right? In entrepreneurship, especially in healthcare. How did you win your first or first handful of paying customers? Take us through that journey. Um, I think the, probably um, building relationships. Um, while, while everybody wants a scalable SaaS business, um, you, you know, uh, healthcare is a, a personal business. Healthcare is relationships. Um, and so, you know, it's, it's getting out there, it's being on the road, it's going to conferences, it's, um, you know, building those, that network and those connections, um, because people want to work with, uh, you know, people that they trust, uh, and people that they like. Yep. Um, and so our early clients, you know, were, um, you know, were innovative health systems, um, you know, that sort of had that ecosystem of, of innovation, Mm-hmm. Um, not every health system has that. So not every health system would be a good client for early stage companies yep. um, because not every health system knows how to innovate. Um, we were you know, fortunate to get connected with those innovations teams and, you know, um, they have equity in us, you know, so that's another thing where, uh, you know, for you're an early stage company and, and you're looking to gain that traction like many times you may need to look at, you know, how can I go identify two or three health systems, you know, have them be my early partners, give them equity. And and then that aligns all those incentives to, they want you to be successful. There's going to be problems, challenges, barriers. um, But uh, if they're in alignment with you, then they're going to be there to help you overcome those. And at the end of the day, then you're stronger because of it. Cause now you're like, okay, we've solved X, Y, and Z challenge. And now when we go to our next phase of clients, you know, we're not going to have those same problems and we know how to address them. And that's, um, you know, where your tools are constantly able to get better and, and evolve. Absolutely. Um, just, yeah. So as we wrap up here um, and you think about, um, you know, you, all the things that we talk about here and your fellow innovators that are in the trenches at different phases of this process, what are some of the other lessons learned or some guidance of what you would say of um, for, for them in their journey? You have, you have to love it. And you have to have a passion for it. Um, you know, it's, it's very difficult to do with dipping your toe in the water. Um, you know, I actually had to, I haven't practiced, medicine now for, for over five years, because I knew that if, if evidence care was going to be successful, that I had to give it a hundred percent of my energy. Um, and I think my wife thought when I left medicine to focus exclusively on evidence care, that, um, 
that I wouldn't have to work as many hours. And, and, and the reality is I work more hours now than I did as a physician. Um, <laughs> oh, yeah. So that's something that folks mm-hmm. need to realize signing up for this. Um, the other thing would be, you know, if I went back when I was first starting evidence care, you know, you think, oh, geez, we're going to go, you know, zero to Instagram in one year and it's going to be amazing. And like people need to realize that, you know, this is this is probably a 10 year journey at a minimum. Yeah. Um, and you need to be, you know, are, are you signed up for that? Is that is that what you're up for? Um, because when you go back and listen to other podcasts of people who've been successful in business, they say every, everybody sees the inflection point where it takes off, but nobody ever sees the seven to eight years ahead of that where they could have given up at any point in that process, but they kept pushing and kept going. And that's the difference, right? Because so many, uh, all those other people are quitting. At, and, you know, I'm not judging them for quitting at year five or year six, <laughs> you yeah. know, because it's hard and it's discouraging. It um, but it's it's those of us that have are left that are just crazy enough to think that it's going to be that next phone call. It's going to be that next email. It's going to be that next relationship, that next conference, whatever that might look like. Um, that's going to be the game changer for that hockey stick growth. And then we're going to finally. <laughs> yeah. You know, the other thing I would say, sorry, for for advice for those listening that are early stage, um, if I recommend one book, it would be a book called Traction. Um, And I don't know if if, if you've ever read it before, but um, it is basically the blueprint for how to operate an early stage company. And I should even say early stage, any company. Mm -hmm. Um, and And if you follow that, um, you know, you're probably three X your, your likelihood for success, because it's going to give you, um, the blueprint for what to do and how to do it and how to think about it to make sure that you're staying focused, to make sure that you're setting those goals, to make sure that you're hitting those milestones. Um, and if you're doing that, then, then your, your, your business is getting better every month, every quarter, every year. Um, and so that's the, uh, you know, um, going to help assure your success. That's so true, whether it's traction or some other methodology, but having a framework that like that, an operational framework. And I I think that that's so important um, for all innovators, but especially for those founders um, or C-suite leaders that are not inclined to that type of structure and system and process. When you're the more visionary, creative, it's so much easier to get distracted by that shiny opportunity. And, you know, you're right that traction and methodologies like that really help bring a lot more focus and alignment, give us some guardrails to to swim in so we don't go off in the deep end. Yeah. And one of the, one of the, sections in that book, you know, talks about, they call them rocks mm-hmm. and, and you come up with a rock for the year and a rock is something that, you know, is, is a milestone or a goal. Um, and you'll come up with two or three for the year, but then you also come up with two or three for every quarter. Um, we now have every employee within our business has rocks every quarter and, and we put them up on the wall. Yep. And, and we share them with the whole company. And then every quarter we celebrate, you know, all the rocks that we hit. And so when you have, you know, we're now up to 40 ish employees and, you know, all of a sudden you have a uh, hundred to 200 rocks that were identified as these are important things for our business. And you're fulfilling those every quarter, you know, you're moving your business along and that's where you get your scale and that's how you get your, your fast growth. Absolutely. And when you have 40 people that are moving in the same direction towards that common goal, that's going to be very different if you've got 40 people that are trying to go in five different directions, right? That's right. <laughs> uh, well, thank you so much for joining me today, Absolutely. sharing your expertise and your um, and, and what it's like um, for you in building evidence care. How do folks get a hold of you if they want to follow up with you after the show? Yeah, absolutely. Um, Folks can find me on LinkedIn probably pretty easily. I'm the only Brian Fengler out there. Um, Company, you know, uh, evidence.care slash info. Um, And we actually are starting our own podcast uh, within the next month or so called the Better Care Podcast. So we'll be launching that pretty soon as well. Awesome. I'll have to dial in, listen up. (laughs) All right. Well, thank you so much for joining me. Absolutely. Thank you, Roxy. Thank you so much for listening. I know you're busy working to bring your life-changing innovation to market, and I value your time and attention. 
To get the latest episodes on your mobile device automatically, subscribe to the show on your favorite podcast app like Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and Stitcher. Thank you for listening, and I appreciate everyone who shared the show with friends and colleagues. See you on the next episode of Health Innovators.